Yes, uh, you're most welcome to join us as well. Thomas Ankara University in Burkina Faso. All right, uh, Dr. Muyanga Innocent Ziba. He probably stepped out briefly. He's the head of the Department of Journalism and Communication at the University of Livingstonia, also in Malawi. All right, uh, let's have Professor Lasagne to also share with us uh, the experience from the Center for National Something. Uh, we do have, we've been joined by Michelle. Michelle is our translator. Thank you very much for offering. <laughs> you certainly, your translation is going to be, to be very handy. Okay, I think we have a full, a full table now, save for Ziba, who will be joining us shortly. All right. Okay, before we broke off for lunch, we, 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 we had a very... Uh, brief but informative presentation from Matthew, in the, uh, who is coming from the University of Ken. Matthew shared with us what they are doing there. He talked about the massive open and online course and how they have used this uh, as a source of engaging different um, partners and also being able to roll out their open and distance learning initiatives. Dr. Muinda, you are not yet here, but uh, we heard from Matthew of that University of Ken that one of the things they do to ensure that uh, this model works is that they have a strong pedagogical but also a strong technical team and they ensure that both of them work hand in hand to avoid conflict but also largely for the smooth running of the project. We'll tease out more of what he said as we go along. But yes, um, now let me invite our next presenter. I don't know whether you prefer to stand up or you'll talk from where you are. Dr. John Semakula, Dr. Tubi, John Semakula. He is from Uganda Christian University. Earlier on, we had Professor Monica Chibita, who is also from Uganda Christian University. You let me know, John, if, uh, if, if you need Professor Chibita to give a rejoinder, because we are blessed that she's still in the room. All right, over to you, John. Thank you very much. Somebody please switch on uh, John's microphone. No, no, he has, he's holding one. John, you have about 15 minutes. 10 minutes. 15, okay. 15. I'll make sure that I work within the 10 minutes allocated 15 to me. 15 minutes. 15, okay. okay. And I'm going to be as brief as possible. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm the head of the undergraduate studies programs at the school of uh, I'm going to uh, make this presentation from a lecturer's perspective. And we agreed with Michelle and other members before coming here that that is actually allowed. Uh, you cannot talk about uh, e-learning uh, in Uganda and at Uganda Christian University without uh, linking it to COVID-19. It becomes extremely impossible. Uh, so f um, I'm going to, uh, uh, as I have been uh, uh, told, I'm a quick learner in journalism in particular by Professor Monica Chibit. I think I'm going to use uh, my story uh, to tell you why e-learning is, uh, is particularly important for Uganda Christian University. Uh, in 2019, I resigned my job uh, full-time from uh, one of the newsrooms uh, in Uganda to venture into full-time teaching at Uganda Christian University. I'd been in the newsroom for uh, over 10 years. 
and uh, Uganda Christian University had actually supported my MA. We are at a public university where uh, uh, the operations might be uh, seriously different. Uh, so when the university closed, it meant that uh, because uh, the money we get, the money the university earns to, uh, for operations comes from the students' fees. And without the students' fees, it means that uh, the university cannot be able to pay staff and so on, and even operate normally. So that's how I entered uh, uh, Uganda, joined Uganda Christian University. At one point, it had been actually, it was chopped. So for us to be able to operate, we, which you still remember, stay uh, from Kono Town where I stay, and go through uh, a graveyard. The university was like a graveyard. And because a person who was used to working with other colleagues and uh, meeting them in office, many of the offices had actually closed. And we only had a skeleton staff that had remained behind. So on a daily basis, I would go through the university asking myself a number of questions and one of them in order to survive. By the time I left the newsroom uh, to join the academic uh, institution, I'd never used any e-learning platform to teach. So it means that, or it meant that I had to learn to adjust in order to be able to teach, but at the same time to earn a living and also retain my job. You also want to understand uh, that 1990s, 1996, around there, uh, in many of our universities, uh, uh, it, w it was actually non-existent. And when we talk about Uganda Christian University, e-learning actually started around uh, uh, 2013. 2013, the idea of e-learning came about in 2013. That was when one of the lecturers from the School of Journalism called uh, Mr. Stephen Chakulumbie uh, contacted or introduced the idea of e-learning to the then Vice Chancellor Professor, no, Dr. John Senyonyi. And after listening to him, uh, uh, Dr. Senyonyi actually allowed him uh, to come up with the guidelines to e-learning. Now I want to go to those uh, slides to make you, such that you can follow me very well. So, uh, okay, slide number one, you, have, you can actually look there. In 2013, uh, Steve, uh, 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 St Mr. Stephen Chakulumbie, uh, a lecturer at the School of uh, Business, introduced the idea of e-learning to the then Vice Chancellor, Dr. John Senyonyi. Uh, uh, e-learning guidelines and policies. That was 2013, you can't imagine that e-learning had come to Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa in 1996, but Uganda Christian University is actually beginning to think about it in 2013. Now, other universities in Uganda, many other universities in Uganda, had even never thought about it by the time uh, COVID struck the country in 2020. So uh, UCU, despite the fact that we delayed to embrace it, uh, by 2020, when uh, COVID uh, struck the country, the world, and un academic institutions were closed in the country, we were still far ahead of many other academic institutions in the country. Now, uh, after there was a gap between 2013 and 2020 when, and 2020, uh, uh, when eventually we, we, we embraced this because after Mr. Chakurumbi introduced this idea to the Vice Chancellor, then by 2015, uh, the university had started to teach physically. There was no serious need, we hadn't seen it. Uh, so uh, in 2015, around 2015, uh, the university employed Miss Center at the university, as you will see uh, down here in, in the second, in the okay, wh which appears to be like the third slide. Can you see that kick off of Ilani? So by 2020, uh, before COVID actually struck, one of the faculties at Uganda Christian University had started uh, uh, coming up with uh, some programs, e-learning programs, and that was the faculty where this Mr. Jakulmi was coming from. So by the time then uh, the university. Uh, 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 the government closed the academic institutions. At least we had set a foundation. And uh, for many of you who are following what was being, uh, okay, I'll go to, uh, I'm going to be brief as I said. I want to talk about uh, the challenges of e, no, uh, challenges, challenges and opportunities of e-learning e at UCU. One of the challenges, uh, as um, I highlight in that uh, slide number four, is internet. We, at the university, we have got Wi-Fi. But now, as we, because currently we are impl implementing what is called blended learning. Uh, the other issue was lack of electricity, uh, a challenge. Electricity in up, up country, particularly up country, but even in uh, urban centers like Kampala here and Mukono, when power goes off, you do not have standby generators, so you cannot actually attend a class. And we are teaching students who are coming, uh, for example, from islands like Buvuma, like Kalangala, where parts are made it extremely hard for us. 
quality education. Um, skilling of lecturers. I told you that at the time I ac actually COVID struck the country, I had never used any e-learning platform. I was a lecturer, I was not concerned. I would go to class, teach students how to write stories and do, and do so. And that's what was important uh, for them. And nobody ever complained about e-learning, whether I had a skill or I did not. But then it became compulsory that I had to do. And slowly, uh, day after day, I've kept on getting a skill here and there. And because uh, we keep on getting refresher courses uh, from the people managing the university uh, um, ICT uh, services. And that's how we've managed to, uh, uh, to adjust. I'm now a better person than how I was uh, uh, before COVID. So COVID was bad, but somehow we've, uh, we, uh, we've ripped in, in the other ways. We need to thank God for that. Okay, the other um, factor uh, is, positive factor is, uh, sorry, let me get it here, something moved. As, uh, easy management of students' uh, uh, exams, marks, uh, and records. Uh, because of the emphasis that has been put on uh, e-learning, it has become extremely easy for us to manage students' uh, coursework, results in particular, because uh, everything is put online. Previously, we would use Excel and Keep, but now everything, all the marks are put into uh, on Moodle, and then the total, the statistics just appear there. Your work is to make sure that you've uploaded them, and then at the end of the day, we also, it's now also easy to uh, issue out the students' uh, record uh, 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 marks to them, because you just pick what is on Moodle, and then put it, you can even put it on WhatsApp for them, so they know their records, and they keep on following, because everything has actually been simplified, okay? Okay, and I think, uh, I think lastly, I shouldn't really go far with this. Students are also studying freely because of this uh, uh, e-learning. Thank you so much for listening to me. If uh, Professor Chipita wants to add on something, please, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, John. You're welcome. Okay, thank you very much, John. We appreciate. So it's been 10 years. Ten years of you implementing um, uh, Professor Paul Virevu Muyinda, Makere University Institute of Open Distance and E-Learning. Over to you, uh, Dr. Paul Muyinda. You have 15 minutes or thereabout. If you can tr w wrap it in 15, that would be great. Otherwise, if you need more time, I could only add you a few, like five. Thank you very much. I don't know whether I can... Uh, whether my presentation, I, I've tried to share on... Uh, the link, Zoom link, I don't know whether you can be able to, f to have it flashed there. Okay. Yes, but uh, I want to first of all take this opportunity to thank uh, our departments of uh, journalism for this on what we are doing in the different arenas and particularly this afternoon on the experiences of uh, of e-learning uh, in the different institutions. I would have loved to really see the presentation here, but uh, I think, yes, I can, uh, can just be able to talk about uh, e-learning at Makere University. Uh, at Makere University, is, as you know, is a public university, and it has uh, a lot of traditions that have been entrenched and to change Makere University over time or overnight is quite a tall order. And many of you who come from public universities of this nature, you know what happens. Uh, Makere University is such a university with many stakeholders. It is not only the students here, nor the staff, but the parents, the government, the MPs, the president, all, everyone, the, 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 the development partners and so on. So if you want to do any change in this university, you must be able to satisfy. We had to go to and explain to parliament why we are changing the mode of delivery. The students, actually led by students from UCU, uh, their guild president there and the guild presidents here, they took us to parliament to go and explain why we should, why, we are, why we are bothering them with this form of delivery. But the beauty of it is that when they reach there and they ask them, why have you come here? They said, these people are forcing us to study using ICTs. 
They said, you go away. Which kind of learners are you? Who do not want to actually use ICTs in the present times. So the Speaker of Parliament and the Minister of Education were there. They, they said, now, you, you, you deal with the... You deal with the, the, there were some other officials there. For us, we've gone for other important issues. And that's when we managed to convince the students. Uh, the parliamentarians, of course, were asking questions. The president asked UCU, how can you invigilate examinations online? Uh, then it took some of us efforts to go and convince the president that uh, it is possible you can, you can do examinations online. And lucky enough, at that particular moment, he had some of his grandchildren who were studying abroad, and they started doing exams from within State House. So then he realized and said, oh, okay, for universities that can be able to, to, to run Odell, uh, you can run Odell. And that's when he invited the National Council for Higher Education uh, to produce guidelines to guide universities or colleges which really preferred to have uh, distance education. And so, of course, uh, National Council for Higher Education invited some experts from within Uganda to go and discuss what could be the guidelines uh, that a university that wants to switch over to e-learning, what could be those guidelines? So we discussed with them and came up with guidelines which actually became the guidelines for emergency remote teaching in different uh, universities. And so the different universities started applying for permission to start to switch over to the emergency remote teaching. Now, the challenge some of us have had as e-learning professionals is that the experience that people have seen during the difficult times is what they think is e-learning. But that's not e-learning. Because at that time, we were just transferring things online and uh, people learning. But that's not, that's not the real online learning. And so, uh, erasing that experience from the minds of our stakeholders is a big, big challenge for us. It's quite a big challenge because as my presenter said, he had never seen e-learning before. But he saw e-learning during COVID-19. So what he saw during COVID-19 is what is e-learning. And so if he got some bad experiences then, then those bad experiences continue to ring in their mind. So that's the big challenge we have as e-learning professionals in the country. We now have another crusade to move around to tell people that what we had in uh, COVID-19 was emergency remote teaching. And therefore, that's why uh, ap applications like, uh, like uh, the Zoom, big blue patterns, those were the applications people are now using. That means we had to transfer the school-based or the classroom-based teaching online. And even now, that's what many institutions are thinking as being online education, which is not the thing, because it creates a lot of challenges for learners. For example, a learner cannot be able to sit on Zoom from 8 o'clock, from 8 o'clock up to 5 o'clock. So many, many learners and many stakeholders are resenting that are resenting online learning because of the way we are implementing it. So our experience uh, spans from Makere University here, what we are doing, and what other people are doing, and uh, how we are trying to be able to, to support this. Uh, now, to come to the journey of e-learning at Makere, uh, for us at Makere University, our journey starts uh, to do, because e-learning uh, cannot be decoupled from distance education. So our journey of e-learning starts with distance education, or starts with uh, continuing education. Because distance education, when it came to Uganda, it was for purposes of ensuring that people who cannot access learning can be able to access learning wherever they were. And to, to ensure that those who want to continuously learn can learn. 
So our journey of distance education, therefore, uh, starts right from 1953. In 1953, we started with what we call the Center for uh, Continuing Education, CCE. Now, CCE, though it was not using uh, digital technologies at that time, was offering some form of distance education. And so many people would be wherever they are, and they would be able to study with support from Makere University. And that's why at Makere University we have a, a hall called CCE. Many people didn't know what that hall mean, meant. Center for Continuing Education. That was a center for adults who could come and study and then go back and then we support them from wherever they are using uh, hard copy materials. And that place was a place where we could find men and women studying. And later on, of course, it turned to a hall of residence. And that hall of residence was called Complex Hall. And the reason why it is called Complex Hall is because it was, it was quite complex. It had, uh, whereas other halls had uh, only one sex or one gender, this hall had, on, had two genders uh, until 1992, somewhere there, when only girls were allowed there. So. But it, that, that hall was taken over by Amin, who came around and found that place empty, but with a lot of beds, well laid, because we were waiting for students, we were waiting for our distance learning students to come and occupy, and then they go away. So the beds were there. So when Amin came, he toured the whole university, and uh, he found that place empty. And in our usual characteristics of always complaining about challenges, the vice chancellor then said, we don't have accommodation. We lack accommodation in the university. Uh, we don't have enough accommodation. Then Amin said, but I saw some accommodation down there, which had beds and, and he ordered, let that be a hall of residence. And boys and men, I mean, boys and girls started staying there. Okay. Yeah, so that's where our journey starts from. Our journey starts from 1953. And uh, okay, so this particular slide shows you where Makere University is, and I think that has been already said. But particularly imp uh, important here is I want to show the gigantic nature of this university, uh, in sense that we have over about forty thousand students, and to convert to, on to online with those forty thousand students is really a tall order. And we have about 1,600 uh, faculty members, staff, and 10 colleges. So I am giving this background to show you how we, our experience with being able to drive this kind of big plan uh, or pilot this kind of big plan. We have 10 colleges. And each college is, is of course, uh, specializes in different disciplines. Each college here is equivalent to a private university. In, uh, in Uganda. Look at, for example, Konas. It, Konas could be having like 5,000 students. Kobams could be having like, like 6,000 students. I, UCU has maybe about 2,000 students. So here. <laughs> so I was trying to instigate you to tell me how many students you have. So yeah, our College of Education and External Studies has about, about 4,500 students. College of Computing alone has about uh, 6,000 students. So I'm trying to tell you the gigantic nature of uh, this university and then show you how we've been able to penetrate with e-learning in this gigantic uh, university. So it's quite a big university. So I was, uh, this, the next statistics here shows uh, the, the, our timelines. I have already talked about the Center for Continuing Education in 1953, and then later this gave birth to the Department of Distance Education uh, in 1991. So, uh, 1991, we started with uh, what we call distance learning programs, the Bachelor of Commerce, Bachelor of Education, and these were using some form of ICTs to support students. So, for us, we don't say e-learning started as, as in uh, as as latest as COVID time. No, we started with e-learning in 1991 because 19, actually 19, 
87 with the African Virtual University. You know very well that the African Virtual University was here in the Department of Distance Education and was, was broadcasting lectures from Washington, D.C. to students who were registered with us there in the African Virtual University. Then we developed our own programs. These are the ones we are calling the bachelor, Bachelors of Commerce, Bachelor of Education. 1991, they started as external or distance learning programs. And then 20, 2003, we had Bachelor of Science, external. And then 2003, again, we had a diploma in youth development work. And 2011, Bachelor of Agriculture and Raw Innovation. These programs were running as first generation distance education programs with support, with limited support of ICT or with limited support of e-learning with them because, uh, because of how we were offering them. Now, later on in 2017, uh, before the coming of uh, COVID-19, uh, we developed a master's program, Master's of Instruction Design and Technology, uh, this is a program that develops people who work with e-learning. Uh, Bachelor of Youth Development Work and a Master of Public Health in 2001 still. Now, these programs were developed based on what we call fifth generation distance education. Now, fifth generation distance education requires a lot of application of online, uh, online learning. So these are online learning programs, the first ever online learning programs at Makere University. Uh, that are based on uh, uh, based on uh, uh, fifth generation distance education or online learning or technology mediated learning. Now, uh, this is how we used to offer our distance education, the first generation distance education. We could have uh, two weeks of face to face. Students would come here for two weeks, then eleven weeks they would go away. They would go away, and once they are away, we support them using technology using e-learning. We support them at centers, study centers, which were, which were across the country. We had, uh, we had nine centers across the country, Jinja, Gulu, and so on, Arua. Then the students would come back to Makere University for another two weeks of face-to-face, -face, just to ensure that they interact with each other. Then they do examinations at the university here. So that continued until, until uh, 20, 2013, when we decided to, to say we leapfrog distance education at Makere University. And so we got a project, we wrote a project which was supported by NORAD, and this project was called Distance Education Leapfrogging Project. That is DELP there in 2014. Our, our aim was to leapfrog uh, from the mode that we were all using the mode of uh, students being aware and then we support them at centers, we support them with the hard copy study materials. But we wanted to, to leapfrog and jump into the fifth generation of distance education where we are using more of online education. So in 2014, we started supporting distance learning students using our learning management system more uh, than ever before. Wonderful, uh, yeah. Professor Minda try and wind up in the next five okay. minutes. All right. As, as you, you leapfrog us. I, I, I'm going to leapfrog you. So, uh, <coughs> now, so in Makere University, we do have uh, a unit which is specialized for providing online pedagogy or e-pedagogy. And I think you was mentioning something like that when, like, when, when you're briefing me about what had happened. We have decoupled e-learning from, from technology. So we are not supporting, uh, the people who support the use of e-learning are not the ones in technology. The technology people come to repair our computers, to install programs and so on. Yeah, so that is the structure of that setup at the Institute of Open Distance and e-learning. And uh, we have college coordinators around the entire colleges. We have e-learning coordinators and what we call e-learning champions. And we have technicians also based in, in the 30 schools at the university. Uh, the IODEL does capacity building for e-learning, distance education, and blended learning. Capacity building on how to pedagogically do this uh, e-learning. We, we have developed uh, training programs for staff 
and this is how we develop our our courses. We do develop our courses instructionally, use in and have we have instructional designers in the Institute of Open Distance and E-Learning, and this is the framework that we use to develop what we call the detailed design document. Because we don't have time, we will just uh, quickly go through. So uh, we've talked about uh, limitations in access. Uh, the university has set up uh, what we call zero-rated Mwele. We use uh, via the telecom companies uh, so that students don't have the problem of uh, costs. Then access to laptops, we have what we call uh, 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 zero, I mean, uh, uh, higher purchase laptops, and we also have what we call laptop banks to ensure that those who don't have access can be able to access. Uh, we have, as I said, we build capacity and training faculty and also training students. Uh, we have uh, been at the forefront of uh, training faculty in all pedagogical aspects of teaching and assessment. And when the COVID-19 time came, uh, assessment became a challenge. So we had to, to use a number of modalities, uh, e-learning modalities, to be able to assess. And uh, these modalities were so many. So the staff were trained on various modalities so they could be able to see which one to, to use. We have a number of collaborating partners that are supporting us in uh, the development of e-learning at Makere University. The recent being Koika. Uh, then we have MasterCard e-learning, MasterCard Foundation e-learning initiative. We have the Research and Innovation Fund grants by Government of Uganda and other, uh, other initiatives that we keep developing to support ourselves in building our capacity and also developing uh, courses. Uh, of course, we do have some challenges. They lead to infrastructure, connectivity, attitude of staff, uh, low number of staff with skills for developing and en engaging online courses. And of course, uh, issues to do with assessment are still there as issues. Uh, we have plans for further development. And the most immediate plan that we are having now is a plan in research in emerging technologies, especially uh, the chat bots. Because our, our students are using chat GPT to answer questions. And we are now trying as an institute, this is our responsibility as an institute, to ensure that we find a way of having ethical use. Because we are not going to ban this technology. We want to come up with ethical use of uh, chat GPT <laughs> so that we can advise, because uh, our one of our mandates is to advise the university in adopting new and emerging technologies. These will always be there. And the university set up this unit, the Institute of Open Distance and E-Learning, to be able to look into this. So we want to see the pedagogical use, the proper pedagogical use of uh, artificial intelligence in education, among other plans that we are having. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I had students clap. Are you using chat GPT? <laughs> really? Who? <laughs> Whose assignment was it? <laughs> right, now we know the culprits. But thank you very much. That is quite uh, an experience you have shared that uh, e-learning here started as far back as 1953. I think all of us in the room here were not yet born. None of us was born. But yes, uh, thank you very much. We shall now uh, hear from the next person. And please, students, keep around. Would like you to share a bit of your experience. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm positive that time will allow. So don't leave yet. Now let me call upon our next presenter, Andrew. Yes, it's your turn, Andrew Kaponye. Please walk us through the experience uh, from your end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, I am tempted to think that the previous speaker represented our institution. So should I conclude that you have uh, provided our experience, except for number of years of experience and the progress you have made so far? Uh, it's quite uh, uh, inspiring. Uh, 
uboro ya life anyway um i am glad to be part of uh, this uh, partnership project uh, because it, I, I, it has come at a time when uh, our country malawi is also uh, uh, rethinking policy direction in education towards uh, uh, e-learning and uh, recently michelle i shared with you uh, that uh, just last week we had uh, a national symposium on e-learning trying to shape the uh, education policy and of course encouraging education institutions to move the uh, e-learning direction because i think uh, as much as we can ignore this but uh, times are changing and uh, classroom based uh, uh, learning is going to disappear very quickly so the quicker also we ad adapt um, I mentioned that uh, there are quite um, a number of issues that uh, have been mentioned by the previous speaker that also relate to us, uh, but I will still uh, summarize a few things. Um, I'm coming from a university which is uh, on paper two years old but it has existed for the past 58 years. So we are 58 years old uh, as a public institution under University of Malawi. But uh, two years ago, it was um, given uh, an independent uh, status to become uh, uh, a standalone university. So when we, when we mention Malawi University of Business and Applied Sciences, then we are talking about a two-year-old um, uh, university. Uh, but uh, when you go to Malawi and mention Malawi Polytechnic, then people know it as a 58-year-old uh, constituent college of the University of Malawi. Um, we, we started off as a center called Continuing Education Center. Um, Makerele is saying Center for Continuing Education. Uh, we, we, we have Continuing Education Center as a CEC, uh, which used to or continues to uh, train as, as students, especially evening and uh, weekends. So we've operated as a such as Continuing Education Center and when you come to Malawi, you mention CEC, everyone will relate because it has uh, uh, trained a lot of uh, students who could not have time to physically uh, attend classes uh, midweek, but uh, they could manage at least after working hours as well as uh, uh, weekends. So that's, I think that's how we have been operating. Of course, minus... Uh, the technology because it was uh, purely uh, uh, classroom based the continuing education center and it continues sadly to do so uh, as, as a department of uh, the university um, but uh, the idea of uh, ODL came very late in 2019 uh, it was embraced uh, with uh, some mixed uh, reactions, you know, and uh, although there were these mixed reactions, uh, the policy of the institution uh, managed to inspire uh, academic staff and departments to embrace the innovation until COVID hit. This is when um, we were overwhelmed seriously and uh, do a rethink in terms of how we continue to deliver uh, university education. Because uh, sadly, when uh, COVID hit, we had to close all schools. You know, so there was a national shutdown in all schools, starting primary schools, secondary schools, and universities. 
that's when there was a serious rethink by the ministry uh, that uh, we, um, we should boost the ODL uh, our intervention so that uh, it, however we adopted the, uh, this as ERT so the, the word E was so dominant in the adoption everyone saw this as an emergency intervention and uh, the expectation was that uh, this emergency would come to an end and go back to what we thought is normal uh, unfortunately now what 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 we are thinking is normal is slowly becoming abnormal <laughs> so um, i think we'll cope with that but um, that's how we started with ERT, we, we experienced quite huge challenges, uh, starting with the students, uh, lecturers, um, ICT personnel, administrators. The, the, the situation wasn't really good uh, to the extent that the delivery of classes was not as smooth as we expected. And uh, one of the experiences I remember were that uh, students would connect on the Moodle uh, using the, blue, the big blue button, but physically not present in class. So <laughs> you, could, you could actually see a number of students, but uh, you ask a question, they are not. And then they devised another way when we realized that uh, they were connecting, but physically not in class. So, <laughs> so what, what they did was to at least send one student to join and record. You know? So that the next time you come to ask questions, they are always, you know, pretending they were in class. But they, were, they weren't. Uh, actually, they just sent someone to uh, actually uh, record. Um, the other challenge that we, we, we have is uh, uh, infrastructure. It continues to be our challenge. I think we have learned yesterday. Yesterday we were with Prof in his department and uh, we've seen how they are overcoming their challenges and uh, we continue to face this. However, when you made a presentation, Prof, yesterday, I was about to promise to you that we'll do an exchange program. But this exchange program is going to be very crazy. Because yesterday you said that you have problems with the, uh, the, 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 the building, you know, uh, which houses or IODL here um, in the opposite direction. We, we had a, a HEST project. Uh, uh, at our university, funded by African Development Bank. They built us a magnificent ODL building. And uh, today, we are using it as a signature uh, building for the university. And yet, it is just ODL. So, I wanted to say that you take the building because you have the capacity and you give the capacity, <laughs> so, which is, uh, of course, not possible. But uh, I think in terms of uh, 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 buildings, we have. Um, you, you be, you'll be visiting uh, uh, Malawi uh, in the next uh, physical meeting uh, that we have. I'm very sure this is the building that we are going to boost, that uh, we have a building here, you know. Um, but um, the issue of training, maybe we'll learn a lot. Uh, from you because as, as lecturers we had the issues with the managing um, uh, e-learning during COVID. We still have issues continuing uh, delivering. We are coping but I think there are so many other issues to do with managing the content management uh, system itself because I think the way we understood it was like, you know, even if you record a class through WhatsApp and just distribute it to students, you are doing e-learning. But it's more than that. Uh, it's beyond that. So it needs a lot of um, 
uh, uh, capacity building and I'm sure through this compass project we are going to benefit because there is a, a TOT uh, a component and definitely our, our, our department is going to actually benefit and then maybe transfer uh, what, we, what we will learn to colleagues. The other, the other challenge is uh, the attitude of students. Uh, in our country, uh, the culture of university is to be seen walking through the corridors of the university physically, you know, get into those rooms, meet lecturers, get out, hug one another, and all the, leave their homes, you know, uh, be free from day-to-day -day, uh, household chores. Now, today, if you, if you tell them that, ah, no, you can learn while home, I'm telling you, we are facing a lot of challenges. There's like no ways. What are you going to be doing with all those spaces uh, at the university? You know, who will be coming? You know, so you, you, you find a class which is virtual. Students are on campus. You know, you know, the, you know because that, that social interaction has been taken away uh, from them. And they want to maintain it. So I think that is the, uh, the challenge. Lecturers too. You know, I think uh, they enjoy seeing those, uh, you know, students interact, seeing their faces, how their faces are reacting to their presentations. But these are, I think, uh, things that uh, we can deal with over, uh, over time. Um, I, I, I will not finish until I mention this issue of uh, internet. Um, our country, uh, internet access is uh, very... Uh, limited, although we are a small country, um, which uh, may be by face value, people think ah, it's, it would be easier, you know, to manage internet in your country because you are a small uh, space. We have uh, campus internet, we call it Edurom, uh, which provides access to all students, but uh, it is overwhelmed with the number of students. So even if you you say, ah, you have access to internet. They will always ask. They will always ask you, where is it? You know, it can show here, but it cannot operate. So don't say you have internet access. You know. So I think we are grappling with the, that issue. I, uh, the other issue that uh, we are grappling with is that uh, our our small country is uh, uh, predominantly rural. You know, uh, few a, a few percentages. Uh, live in towns. So even these students, some of these students who would opt for e-learning, working in rural, rural areas, employed by NGOs and the like, uh, they wouldn't have the smooth access while in those rural areas. So I think we have a department, a government department, which actually uh, looks at uh, universal access. Uh, they are trying, but uh, we, we, we are really struggling in that area. And of course, the cost of buying computers, um, maybe smartphones. You know, we have uh, phones in our country, you know, that, um, that have got, of course, a local people gave, it, uh, gave them local names. But they are just for calling and receiving calls. So you wouldn't do uh, very uh, sophisticated things using those phones. Until we address, I think, these issues, then you come back here and uh, celebrate eating in Tochi. Oh, no. You call it Toki? Yeah, Matoke. Matoke, yes. In our country, we call, we call them Tochi. You know, so we come and celebrate, but uh, we are thankful that uh, Compass uh, will definitely add significant value to the digital revolution. And uh, as I mentioned, we are uh, eagerly you know, anticipating uh, this revolution and uh, we'll transfer this to our colleagues. I think that's, that's all I can say about MUBAS for now. Thank, thank you, you, thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Dr. Andrew Kaponya from MUBAS, that is Malawi University of Business and Applied Sciences. I've, I hope my colleague, Dr. Sarah Namsoga, is taking note of these similarities that are coming through. Uh, 
from the shared experiences, irrespective of the fact that the universities are far apart. And uh, please, you see, you, what is the student population? We need to correct that record. <laughs> 1,000, you're taking it low way. But yes, uh, please, it was a joke. Uh, yeah, it was a joke. <laughs> Dr. Muinda is, is, is very, he has a good sense of humor. Okay, let's, let's go to the next presenter. Dr. Muyanga Innocent Ziba, who is the head of the Department of Journalism and Communication at the University of Livingstonia. How old is your university? His is two years, slash 58. <laughs> <coughs> Good afternoon. But, um, I think uh, my voice is loud. You are not hearing me? Yeah, um, I come from the University of Livingstonia. University of Livingstonia is uh, almost 700 kilometers from Mubas. It is in the extreme north of the country. Uh, it is a Christian university just like a, a Christian university of uh, Uganda. Um, we, we have uh, four campuses, but uh, we we we'll have uh, five campuses uh, in September because we are, we are establishing another uh, center in the capital because all these years we are, we are in the northern part of the country. Some, uh, the extreme north of the country, they speak Swahili, just like you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the investor was born in uh, 2003, so I think it's 20 years old, 20 years old. Uh, but it was the first educational institution in, in some parts of East and Southern Africa. Uh, the university uh, was born, I mean, the, 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 this, the institution was born Soon after Dr. David Livingstone visited uh, this part of Africa and he sent Dr. Robert Laws to open up uh, education facilities. By then, uh, the, the actual university started in 2003, this e-learning e uh, process. Uh, as, a, as a Christian university, we believe that uh, COVID was there for a purpose. Because in any crisis, you, you rain some. And he, he, we were in a crisis. Yesterday we visited the, and you know, it, and you know, it, it, was, it was not easy. Because uh, the university had first of all to train, uh, the university had first of all to train uh, the lecturers how to operate a Google Classroom. This was a shutdown, whereby there, was no, there were no movements in Malawi. Schools were, were, were shut, were shut down. Um, markets, there were no markets. And uh, everybody was home. But now we're saying, what are we going to do? Because uh, our investor is so much student-centered, and we want to uh, we, we ensure that the students finish in good time. Now, I was like, I mean, uh, we were like, what are we going to do? So the first, so the first step was to train <laughs> the, the lecturers. And by that time, uh, the, the students were scattered, both in rural and the urban areas. And most of uh, our students uh, come from the rural areas. Now, we are saying, we, 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 we sent emails to them, we sent messages to them through phones to say, we have introduced this uh, e-learning program. And they were like, ah, now uh, we don't have electricity in rural areas, okay? How are we going to sustain this process? And they were like, ah, try your best, try your best. So we, we started using Google Classroom and uh, we, we started small Few students were attending the lecturers, but eventually the system uh, grew and the more and more students 
uh, started attending the lecturers. And then he, when he, uh, the restrictions were removed by government, the students came back to the campuses. And uh, since that time, we, ha we, ha we, ha we have been using Google Classroom as the, uh, uh, something that is complementary to physical learning. And the, through this one, students are able to, to get their results. And the, some, of, some of the lecturers still use the, use the uh, Google Classroom to teach the students, especially during weekends. And the, out of this uh, e-learning, uh, with the weekend class, classes were born. So we have weekend classes, and the we, we, we weekend students sometimes uh, run through Google Classrooms. Then uh, I think that was in 2021 when we advertised for our courses. We had uh, many journalists who wanted to, to, to get trained. And uh, because of that, we had no option but to, to start some, some areas of uh, Google Classroom. But then we were warned by the National Council for Higher Education that we should be able to what? We should be able to formally apply so that uh, we are accredited and then uh, we, we, we start the, the process according to the legal requirements. So uh, the application was sent to National Council for, uh, National Council for Higher Education chair. We are, we are yet to receive uh, the node, but I'm very sure uh, the node will come soon. But then we, we had challenges on the e-learning. One was electricity. Uh, we had electricity a uh, few months ago. We had the, maybe only 12 or 14 hours of electricity per day. But now the situation has improved. We have more hours of electricity than before. And then uh, another thing was uh, teaching an empty classroom where you, don't, you actually don't see the students. Okay? It was not easy. It was not easy. Uh, at first, but uh, eventually, I think we got used. Even the students, as uh, uh, Andrew had, had already alluded to, uh, the students love to be in a physical university, and uh, it was not easy for for the students to get used to that. And then uh, another challenge. That's, that we still have is the infrastructure. And then we have uh, the problem of um, facilities, fac facilities for e-learning. But I think uh, very soon uh, the university will, will buy, will buy uh, different forms of, of technology so that we, we are able to sustain this e-learning process. I don't think uh, I have uh, forgotten anything. Because uh, you, you know it is just a new investor, a, a new facility for us. So I think uh, I don't have enough to say. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Ziba. I have noted you, you, you said you're still waiting for a node from your National Council for Higher Education in using online platforms. But you're running with them nonetheless. Okay, thank you very much. That's a, an important one. All right, let's cross over from Malawi and go to Burkina Faso. Uh, we have two colleagues. Sorry, I skipped you, but let's, let's have the block and here. G give us a feel of that. Um, we, shall use, hmm? we shall use translation. Uh, so let me invite Professor Ashil. Sorry if I mispr mispronounce your name. From the Thomas Sankara University. Please, you're most welcome. Yes, thank you. My name is uh, Achille Diendere. Achille Diendere. Achille Diendere. I 
come from uh, Burkina Faso uh, in uh, the capital, Ouagadougou. Ouagadougou, the capital. Ouagadougou. Ouagadougou. And uh, uh, thank you very much for your welcome. I'm uh, very glad to be here for for Uganda, eh? Uganda. Me, I, my English is very, very bad. Don't uh, let me speak in French, and I will uh, ask uh, Michel to trade for me. Thank you. Donc, euh, je viens de Thomas Sankara, Monsieur Thomas Sankara, qui est une université publique et créée il y a à peu près une quinzaine d'années. C'était au départ une seule université à Ouagadougou et depuis une quinzaine d'années, elle a été scindée en deux. Et donc, il euh, y a une partie qui va regrouper les sciences économiques, les sciences de gestion et les sciences juridiques pour M. Thomas Sankara. Il y a à peu près 70 filières qui y sont déroulées, licence, master, doctorat. Et nous avons une formation, plus précisément un certificat en journalisme, communication et conflit. Et ce certificat est logé dans un institut qu'on appelle Institut universitaire de formation initiale et continue, dont je suis le premier responsable, dont je suis ancien chercheur et responsable de l'institut. So, I will try to sum it up. Um, Thomas Sankara University is a state university in Burkina Faso. Uh, it was created, it was established um, almost 50 years ago, and originally it was one single university in Ouagadougou, and then it was split into two universities. The, uh, the one, the, the leg um, at Thomas Sankara is much uh, dedicated to economic sciences, to managing uh, sciences and to law. Um, they are, totally speaking, 70 tracks at uh, Thomas Sankara, including a certificate in so-called communication and journalism um, regarding conflicts area. Um, and uh, this certificate is located in a center called the um, University Institute of Initial and Continuous Training, whose Achille is the, the boss, actually. Et à peu près 40 000 étudiants pour nous citer. And totally there are almost 40,000 students in at Thomas Sankara University. En matière de e-learning, Thomas Sankara a, a dispose d'un institut, comme euh, ici, hein, comme en Ouganda ici, à Makerere, qui s'appelle Institut de formation ouverte à distance. Depuis euh, 5-6 ans, donc il fait des formations, donc de e-learning, et euh, en plus de, cette, de cet institut-là, le Burkina Faso dispose d'une université depuis 2-3 ans qui s'appelle Université Virtuelle, donc qui est chargée de dispenser des, des cours en, en ligne. Um, so there is, um Um, an Odell, local Burkina Bay Odell, which is exactly the, the same translation into, uh, from the French to the English, uh, located at the, at the university. It's a uh, five year, and it's the institute which is in charge of the e learning section. And uh, beside that, there is a so called virtual 
university, it's something equivalent um, to the um, African virtual university you've mentioned, uh, sponsored by the, the, um, the African um, Development Bank, and this one is sponsored by the, the Francophone area, the Francophone organization throughout the Western uh, Africa. Uh, so that's the virtual uh, university and it's a uh, two to three year old experience. Et il faut dire que depuis la crise de, de la Covid, il y a le gouvernement, donc à travers le ministère de l'enseignement supérieur, qui promeut maintenant l'enseignement à distance. Donc c'est un choix qui est fait au Burkina Faso de développer davantage le e-learning, cela pour faire face aux chocs comme la Covid, mais également des chocs comme l'insécurité, qui touche donc beaucoup de zones rurales. Donc il n'y a pas d'école donc de diversité dans les zones touchées par le terrorisme. Donc il est important de nos jours de développer ces cours de e-learning. So, yeah. since, since the Covid appears, it was exactly the, the, the same trend than in all of the countries and the Ministry of Higher Education has started to promote the e-learning and to make it uh, very, very concrete. And beside the, uh, the, the crisis, the, the uh, disruptive crisis um, that was um, conveyed by the, the, the pandemic, there's also, in the case of Burkina Faso, of Burkina Faso, sorry, um, an issue of insecurity, of terror attacks, especially in rural areas in the north of the country. So there's this both crisis that occurs in the case of Burkina Faso. Maintenant, concernant les, les difficultés, ce sont à peu près les, les mêmes qui ont été soulevées par mes prédécesseurs. Je dirais en gros trois ou quatre difficultés majeures. La première, c'est l'accès à Internet, qui est difficile dans nos pays. Deuxièmement, ce sont les questions liées aux infrastructures qui sont assez faibles, peu développées. Troisièmement, il y a aussi la, la réticence de, des enseignants, donc de développer, de modéler en, en courant en ligne. Et puis, euh, quatrièmement, il y a aussi euh, le fait que les étudiants euh, veulent encore ce contact physique avec les, les salles de, de cours. Donc, il y a un besoin des, des, des étudiants de vouloir vraiment être à l'université pour, pour apprendre. Donc, pour terminer, pour résumer, donc, il y a de la volonté politique, il y a aussi des, des possibilités parce que l'accès à Internet se développe avec les réseaux de téléphonie mobile, mais il y a aussi des difficultés liées aux infrastructures liées à l'Internet qui font que c'est encore difficile de mettre en place les coûts à, à distance comme le souhaite. Merci à tous. So the challenges, the challenges, oh, challenges sorry. Um, are quite the same from what has been said already. Uh, internet connectivity, that is still an issue in the case of Burkina Faso. Um, the infrastructure, you mentioned that, uh, Andrew, and that's not that developed in the case of Burkina Faso as well. Uh, there's also something that maybe um, has been mentioned already, the reluctance of trainers um, to design dedicated courses uh, for online trainings. And um, there's also a reluctance from the side of the trainees themselves, from the students themselves, and the need of in-presence uh, requested by them to be there on the campuses and, and so on. So to make it short, it's there's um, a political will to develop the e-learning uh, structures and the e-learning models. The infrastructures are developing, especially through the telco companies, and uh, there are still challenges in the same time uh, in the case of Burkina Faso. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, yes. Okay, let's just proceed. Mm. Yes, okay. yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, every, everybody. Um, yes, I am uh, Lassani uh, Yamiro. 
Uh, I come from uh, Burkina Faso at uh, Joseph Kizerbo University. Uh, Department of uh, Journalism and uh, Communication. I would like to speak uh, so uh, sorry. I am going to speak uh, in French. Thank you for your understanding. Alors, euh, l'université. Pardon. L'université euh, Joseph, Joseph Kizerbo est la toute première université publique du Burkina Faso. Elle a, elle a été créée en 1974. Donc, encore, elle est, elle est récente par rapport à cette université euh, de Ouganda qui a fêté euh, son centenaire il n'y a, a pas longtemps. Elle abrite euh, plusieurs facultés, dont euh, l'Institut panafricain d'études et de recherche sur les médias, l'information et la communication. Évidemment, je suis enseignant euh, de cet institut, mais par ailleurs, je suis chercheur rattaché institutionnellement au Centre national de recherche scientifique et technologique. Alors, euh, dans cet institut qui forme des étudiants en journalisme et en, en communication, je dois dire que l'expérience du e-learning n'est pas encore à l'ordre du jour. C'est-à-dire que euh, il n'y a pas encore de module dispensé en ligne dans cet institut. Il est arrivé de manière occasionnelle. Si c'est bon, tu, tu me dis de. Il est arrivé de manière occasionnelle euh, qu'un enseignant euh, qui intervient depuis, par exemple, Paris, euh, depuis, par exemple, Montréal, euh, qui doit se déplacer à Ouagadougou, euh, qui malheureusement n'y arrive pas, faute d'agenda ou faute de contraintes, euh, demande donc à intervenir en ligne, c'est de manière euh, occasionnelle. Alors, par contre, dans le pays, comme l'a dit mon collègue euh, Achille, le directeur donc, de, de l'UFIC, euh, il y a des initiatives euh, en matière donc, de e-learning. À Bobo Dioulasso, la deuxième ville du pays, abrite également une université publique. Euh, il a été créé en 2017 un institut sur les métiers de l'information. Cet institut, depuis 2020, euh, à la faveur de la crise Covid, comme l'a rappelé mon collègue, euh, désormais dispense intégralement les cours en ligne, en journalisme. Et cet institut collabore avec l'école de communication de l'université Lumière Lyon 2. Euh, ça veut dire que c'est cette université de Lyon 2 qui a facilité le transfert de la technologie, c'est-à-dire comment désormais un enseignant peut mettre à disposition d'un étudiant ou des étudiants son module, son cours, et interagir avec lui à distance. Il y a cette initiative qui existe au sein donc de cette université qui est dans la deuxième ville du Burkina Faso. Alors, le... C'est bon, okay. I will try to, to translate the first part, um, otherwise I will be overwhelmed. Um, so the, the Lassane comes from the University Joseph Kizerbo, which is a little bit complicated to pronounce in the Ugandan way. So it's Z-E-R-B-O, Kizerbo. Um, and it's the very first um, 
state university in Burkina Faso. It was established in 1974, so next year it will be the, not the cent centenary, but the, the, uh, the, the, the 50 years um, anniversary of the, of the university. And uh, Lassane is working in an institute called the uh, Pan-African Institute of Research and Studies on Media and Communication. Uh, so it trains uh, students and uh, future journalists um, in this matter, and he also works for the National Center of Research and uh, Technology, where he's a researcher. Um, the main point of um, this uh, deliberation was that e-learning is not in the agenda to be to be uh, straightforward uh, in the case of uh, University Kizerbo. Occasionally there are some trainers from Paris for example or from Montreal in the Canada um, who made some training uh, live through the um, through the e-learning but it's not really e-learning sessions um, but despite that there is um, another university another public university in the second uh, city of uh, Burkina Faso in Bobo Diolasso and uh, there is their institute established in 2017 the institute of uh, the um, the um, once again institut des métiers de l'information des métiers de l'information the, the media institute of uh, media media jobs let's say like that and uh, from the uh, from the date of the pandemics when the camp the, the pandemic the, the the covid pandemics appears so in 2020 uh, they develop an online only course for uh, journalism uh, track for the journalism track in partnership with the university of lyon in france uh, who which were in charge of the uh, teaching te technology transfer um, they taught the, the people how to be trained and how to engage with the students through the e-learning platforms they have developed in this uh, occasion. Oui, uh, je, je pense que uh, je ne me suis pas très bien fait comprendre. En fait, à l'université Kizerbo, c'est au département communication journal, à l'institut communication journalisme média, qu'il n'y a pas de formation uh, en ligne. Par contre, au sein du campus, au sein de l'université, il y a également euh, l'institut dont parlait euh, mon collègue, l'institut de formation ouverte à distance. C'est-à-dire que la même institut existe à l'université Thomas Sankara et à l'université Kizerbo. Il y a des filières donc, euh, dans les domaines euh, scientifiques, les sciences dures, où il y a effectivement euh, des enseignements qui sont donnés à distance. It's worth mentioning that uh, the, the, uh, indeed that the, the, um, the so-called ODEL, the, the Open Distance and E-Learning uh, Center that exists at Thomas Sankara University also exists in the campus. The, the uh, E-Learning is not in the agenda at the journalism uh, center inside the Joseph Kizabo University, but it does exist in some other tracks for example, in hard sciences, there are some e-learning models already, so it does exist, actually. Alors, euh, c'est tout cela faisant que lorsque nous avons euh, obtenu euh, le projet euh, Compass, euh, nous sommes allés vers les autorités euh, universitaires, le corps enseignant de l'Institut panafricain d'études et de recherche sur les médias, l'information et la communication, pour leur exposer donc les enjeux du projet. Tout de suite, euh, il a été très bien accueilli, euh, d'autant plus que ça sera une expérience de pouvoir développer euh, des, des cours en ligne au sein donc de, 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 de ce département et de cet institut-là. Je peux continuer Yeah. So with the, the Compass project, uh, it, it has seen from the very beginning when it was presented to the authorities in uh, the University Joseph Kizerbo and they, there was a, a real welcome there because it was seen as a first experience to design e-learning models uh, as far as journalism is concerned and as far as journalism uh, regarding uh, migration and mobility issues are concerned. Pour terminer, je dirais que euh, personnellement, je suis très enthousiaste de euh, participer à, à ce projet-là, euh, d'autant plus que euh, l'enseignement euh, 
en ligne euh, est une voie de déterritorialisation de l'accès euh, au savoir. On ne, on, ne, on ne reste plus forcément dans un endroit géographique euh, fixe, donné, pour recevoir le savoir, mais avec cette ouverture, il est possible pour un étudiant de rester partout euh, dans le monde et de pouvoir donc suivre euh, les, les, les enseignements et de sortir avec, euh, avec un diplôme. Merci. So Lassane is really looking forward to the next step, and there's uh, really some enthusiasm in the, into this uh, kind of uh, experience, and it's a way, he said, to widen the territories of knowledge. Uh, it's not limited to a certain limited area, a restricted area, but it's open up to the world and to the, the world of knowledge, and that's the way he is uh, looking at it, and he thanks you very much indeed for your listening. Our colleagues from Burkina Faso, thank you very much and uh, thank you for the excellent translation. The students were smiling at first. <laughs> for the first time, they are cornered. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, so yeah, let's, let's, let's embrace um, more languages. It's always an advantage to know an extra language. Okay, we cross over to Portugal now. Yes, uh, Sarah, I'll come to you. Let's just cross over. Somebody's waiting to make their presentation. Are we set? All right, uh, that is our last presenter, sharing experiences from, the, uh, from Lisbon University Institute at the University of Lisbon in Portugal. We have Anna Pinto, uh, who is a senior researcher at that institute. Over to you, Anna. You're most welcome to make your presentation in 15 minutes or so, 20 years. So, 20 years. So, 20 years. I will be try, I try to I will try to to make it short. Thank you very much for having me. I would rather be there with you of course, but it was not uh, within the Compass project to be together or in person. So, but we are talking about uh, e-learning and distance, so I am at distance, and if it were not for these um, wonderful technologies, I could not be there with you. So, uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, for, first of all, I have to, to just uh, thank you very much for uh, to Macquarie University and Kampala for putting together all the, this very, very interesting event. I've been here since 7 a.m. Yes, <laughs> um, taking a look at what you are uh, talking about. And of course, I have to thank you very much uh, to Professor Fengler for having us uh, in this marvelous project and being able to share all these um, things that we have been sharing. Um, and thank you very much once again. I will, I'm going to put my PowerPoint presentation. Can you see it? Is it okay for you? Can you just tell me if it, you can see it? Yes, we can. You may proceed. Yes, Anna, we can see your presentation. Thank I you. I cannot hear you. So, oh, oh, yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Um, let's uh, let's start with. I'm just going to present the, uh, our very quickly our team here in Portugal for the Compass project. They cannot be here unfortunately because they are actually out of Lisbon in other projects. Uh, so the lead it's, it's Professor Gustavo Cardoso. Uh, he's a full professor at our university, and I am the local implementation coordinator. I am a researcher here at our university, and just to, to be to tell you uh, how old is our university, because all of you have done it. Our university is this year 51 years old. It's not one of the oldest one in Portugal, uh, but it, it's not that bad. 51 years is quite an age. Um, and also we have Joana Azevedo. She's uh, she's specialized in migration issues, and she will be a very uh, a very good asset to our project. And our academic manager Thelma Carrillo. Um, so I have to put it here. All of us have spoken about this. Uh, so yes, uh, COVID, very, very, um, 
And for our university, this, this was not a very important issue to bet on e-learning because Portugal is a very small country when compared to most of your countries. Um, and uh, the accessibility to about the, the experience on our sociology and communication department. Um, but what can I say? With COVID, we were like forced to think about this. And of course, I uh, totally agree with what some of you ha ha have spoken. I think it was Professor Paul that spoke about uh, having classes by Zoom, it's not a learning, uh, but it was a start. And this made us think that maybe for certain kind of students, e-learning could be a very good solution. So we started to work on it. We had already uh, made some previous work on e-learning, but there were very strict rules, especially about the evaluation of the students um, that were not allowing us for to go on with our project of a post-grad course uh, that should be online, that should be uh, uh, e-learning based. So for, for us, in this case, uh, COVID helped us to get what we wanted. It was not all bad. It was quite bad, but uh, it had some something good out of it also. Um, so at this time, we have um, we have a, a, a distant learning and um, and learning strategy in our communication department. Uh, and for now, we just have courses. We just have post-graduation courses and spe specialization courses that are online. We don't have masters, we don't have undergraduate, and we don't have a PhD, okay? So this is our strategy to start with this, because also there are some bureaucratic issues that have to be um, uh, bared in account to make this uh, work. So right now, uh, we, what we have right now, we have postgraduate diplomas. We have one in communication and policy advising that it's with blended learning. So we do have uh, some classes that are in presence at the university, but we also have a part of the work that is done uh, in a new learning platform. And uh, we have like tutors for the students that accompany them uh, so that they can develop their work uh, best. We also have, we, with this kind of, of, of um, functioning, uh, the, the postgrad diploma in information, disinformation and fact checking. Uh, the next year is going to be the first one that we will have it. Uh, quite well um, and we all have we already have a lot of students enrolled uh, we also have short spe specialization courses um, one of them is and of course Portugal is a, a small country but for, uh, football is very big in here so uh, we do have have a communicating in in football uh, specialized in India of, of football we also have a course on information visualization that works um, only on e-learning and we have synchronous and asynchronous uh, work so we do have uh, sometimes when we have classes by zoom but we also have our uh, e-learning platform that accompanies them and we share a lot of um, of um, of materials and we do uh, accompany the students in in their work throughout our platform um next year we are preparing uh our how, how can i say our baby this was the course that we wanted to do before uh the pandemic and we wanted to do it on learning on e-learning but we could not do it uh, because of what I told you, the bureaucracy and um, especially the issues that were raised about how students would be evaluated and how we could give them a diploma after that. So, but this now is solved. And uh, so we are going to um, go ahead with our journalism in Portuguese language course. Uh, and 
we already have a partnership uh, with Google. Um, they are going to work with us on a journalism laboratory uh, for experiencing new practices. And they are all also going to give um, about 15 to 20 grants for students in African Portuguese speaking countries to be able to participate uh, in this postgraduate diploma. Uh, this will be fully online. Uh, it, it's going to be also synchronous and asynchronous, and we are going to use um, we are we are going to use uh, the Moodle platform, but this is not uh, is not fully closed because um, as we are working with Google, it is possible that we will use Google Classroom. Um, so, in um, the platform that we use, uh, so a, a little bit of our uh, technical issue, is the Moodle, the Moodle platform. Uh, it is the platform that was chosen by our university. So we didn't really have a word on on uh, on, on the on the chosen uh, of the, the the platform, uh, but um, the reasons why it was chose platform it is already very much tested um, and it is quite easy to work with it and um, actually for it to work uh, best. Um, there are some training courses for teachers for the better use of the platform and we do have courses so internal courses in the university uh, that help us with course design with evaluation and the use of uh, of the platform in general uh, for us um, that there was a very important point um, that it's the internal communication about e-learning and about what you have to do as a teacher and the difference of teaching uh, e-learning learning and distance learning and teaching in a classroom. This was very important because as a lot of you have, have stressed out, um, it is very different, different to learn in on a classroom or throughout e-learning or distance learning. Uh, so we in our university, um, we have been doing a, a very important work uh, in what regards um, the training of teachers to do this the best way possible and for teachers to to have skills uh to be good teachers also on this new environment because as most of you have said one of the things that we learned is that um when we were on on the pandemic that everyone was uh, compelled well it was not compelled everyone had to do this uh throughout platforms like zoom or or, or um, microsoft teams um and people were just doing the same thing as as they did on the classroom and actually i don't remember uh, which one of you said it it doesn't work to have people like five or six hours in front of a computer um so um, this is what we are trying to say to people that e-learning is not this, and we are trying to make them also design courses and the, the, the pedagogical part, it's very, very important for e-learning. Um, so uh, we also have a very interesting experience, and uh, this, is, this is an experience that we also had with the Eric Prost Institute. Um, this is the Newsreel project. Uh, it's on. Uh, it's a, 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 an Erasmus uh, plus K A two project. This is quite complicated, but it's a European uh, project um, with um, with all these partners that you can see here from Hungary, from Germany, uh, from Romania, from the Czech Republic, and uh, from Germany, of course. Um, and what we did was um, try to make. A, e-learning materials um, that would be interesting and would be very important for the next generation of European journalists. Uh, and I'd have to say that it's not just European. So if you want to be in contact with this, this, um, uh, these materials, you can do it because they are free for you to see. And we have areas 
uh, that we have worked like data journalism, uh, like business and journalism, like debunking. So we have a lot of interesting materials for you to go and, and see. Uh, it's very interesting because we also developed syllabus uh, syllabuses for uh, all of these courses and also if you are um, a professor if you are a teacher you can use them um, to enrich your materials and for your classes so I invite all of you to go to our uh, to, to the website of our newsreel project I can um, I can actually may put it uh, there if you want to to go to our website or it can be shared later on uh, so, um, one of our biggest challenges was the development of the e-learning platform, uh, because the, the University of Pech in Hungary, they were responsible for the project, and they um, opted to do a proprietary e-learning platform. So, this, is, this was not Moodle, this was a platform that was developed for this project, and this brought us some kind of uh, problems um, because having a platform developed for this uh, give, brings some challenges and one of the challenges is you have to have it updated and it's not that much versatile as all of these kind of uh, platforms that already exist and have a lot of people working on them. Uh, but nevertheless, it was a very interesting project. Uh, the second part of the project will um, will be over by August this year, um, but uh, it was an experience that I think we can also encompass, um, profit a little bit from it and uh, what happened with it. Also, um, at our university, we have, we have talk a little bit about the games and the challenges that all of this of the the e-learning um teaching has taught us and we are learning so it, it it doesn't end here so we are always learning um the games and some of you already talked about this so this is the good part of being the last because a lot of things you have already spoken about so uh, one of them is getting to students that can't come to the university because some of the students, they cannot come to the university, even if we are a small country, so they cannot all come. So we did have more students that lived in other parts of the country, okay? We also had students from the Portuguese speaking countries like Brazil, like Angola, okay? And Guinea, uh, that could do our courses. And this is very interesting because this also gives us a diversity of students. And this is this also makes the course much more interesting because it's more rich and diverse. And this is this is quite a that me and my colleagues we, we talk a lot about it. Uh, also it brings more flexibility on learning times. So um, your availability and special if you are already working it's very important if you have this kind of flexibility because you do the things in your own time uh and about the challenge the challenges uh so one of the biggest challenges is design a good course structure that allows students to have the best learning as possible so they should have the best learning as if they were in a physics classroom or us uh, on e-learning, they can have access to a lot more of materials and a lot more of things than they when they are in a classroom. So, um, choosing video is it more appropriate? to do this with the text? Is it more appropriate to have some kind of interactive, interactive gaming? So this, this is also a challenge. Um, and also uh, making sure students have good support and follow up. Because one of the things that happens that sometimes e-learning courses can quickly be um, turned into something that is not very close and personal and human, human, sorry. Um, and also the, 
more technical parts, choosing a stable and user-friendly platform for students and professors. There are a lot more. So this was what I wanted to tell you. I don't think if I took all my time or not, because I was a little bit enthusiastic about it. Thank you very much, Anna. You've done so well. I don't know if you have any uh, questions. Uh, uh, if you could just uh, share that link to your website, I think it's a good resource uh, and colleagues might want to check it out. Thank you very much, Anna. Yes, we've had a wonderful time. Just one, I want one student, one undergrad student, and then there's Sarah. Come, come and tell us very honestly what your experience was or what your experience has been with Odell. We have learned uh, from the interactions here that at Makere, it was emergency remote learning. What we were thinking it was the launch of, of, uh, of, of e-learning. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Miriam Najingo. I'm a final year student of journalism and communication here at Macquarie University. Um, my experience of online with online learning, it was uh, full of distractions. Um, internet was a very big issue. Uh, you've talked about it, and it was still a big issue on our side because you realize that we come from villages and Internet is a very big issue there. Secondly, uh, distractions from guardians, because I believe um, for some of you who are parents, you can uh, attest to this. If you see your daughter there, okay, she's seated, uh, she's in class, but then there is something that you want them to send you. Don't you call them? Uh, please come and send me this. Miriam, come and send me this. So it sort of distracts me as a student. Um, Another thing that I realized, uh, there's a certain group of people that were left behind. And these are people with special needs. They were left behind, especially people who are visually impaired and people who have uh, hearing impairments. These are people who cannot, if someone cannot uh, hear you, then that means if it's a Zoom lecture, they won't get to know what you're discussing. And therefore, maybe we would request um, provisions for sign language interpreters. Because on Zoom, Zoom has a, a provision for transcriptions. But if you follow it clearly, what you say, it will, like in a sentence, it will give you five words out of 10 correctly. I don't know if I'm wrong. Um, another thing, people with uh, visual impairments, with, uh, first we had Moele. These people didn't have uh, talk backs, that the Muele system didn't have a provision for talk backs. So these people ended up suffering a lot because they would not you know, get to know whether their work has been submitted or not. But since I have no time, that is what I can say. And I would request that uh, we kindly take into consideration these things as we go forward, but really appreciate that the university was in a position to adopt this system and we were able to learn. It was a blended learning and we really appreciate that we didn't lose a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Miriam. This, this is a gentleman seated there. Dr. Paul Mean. yes. He's the one you'll, you'll look out for. And, and I'm glad uh, the project investigator, principal investigator is here. This is very good feedback. Sarah, in one minute, Sarah is, come, come, come over. Sarah is representing the graduate students. She's on a master's program. Yeah, in one minute exactly, as another Sarah prepares to close this wonderful session. Dr. Sarah Namsoga will close. So after this, Sarah Kajingo, we shall have you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marina, for, for uh, great moderation and our dear panelists for an intellectually nourishing afternoon. One key takeaway that has caused excitement across our master's uh, platforms is that Makere University will not ban chat GPT, but instead you will uh, draft uh, guidelines for us. But um, otherwise, our class has been enabled by, by online. We are especially happy today because uh, this semester was dominated by online classes. So, of course, which takes away interactions between us. So we are back today as a family. And from here, we shall have a discussion before 
we get it to exams. But on the whole, as a country, proliferation of smartphones is increasing. Um, although data is still expensive, and of course, um, um, on gender, the phones are mostly owned by, by the men in homes. So, but we are, we are improving. May just to shock uh, Dr. Malina that we were not cornered, that our lecturers ha actually taught us French, <laughs> and I'm going to reminisce uh, some French. Uh, uh, so, je ne sais pas si uh, j'ai compris bien, vous avez dit qu'il y avait une seule université publique uh, à Nougadougou. Um, uh, juste a dit qu'il y a plus de possibilités en collaboration avec Makerere, les plus anciennes universités um, en Ouganda. Mais ici, en Ouganda, on ne pratique pas le français. Je peux parler un peu, mais juste à dire bienvenue en Ouganda. Nous, vous êtes notre frère et, et soeur. Bienvenue en Ouganda, la plus be bel pays en Afrique de l'Est. Merci beaucoup. <rires> Thank you very much, Sarah. <laughs> you have represented the group very well. The other ones continued smiling. <laughs> Sarah, come. Come and wind up this session. Thank you, everyone. It's been wonderful having you. How about you? Wow. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Sarah, you've ended on a high. And um, so. Thank you everyone. On behalf of Dr. Taewa, who is the institutional coordinator, um, I would like to thank all of you for your time, for taking off your precious time to come and be with us today. Uh, Dr. Taewa has been called away uh, for an emergency, so he's unable to, to be with us here. But um, I would like to thank you all especially everybody, the VC, the DVC, the principal, deputy, the dean, head, Prof. Fengler, Michelle, our partners uh, from Malawi and Burkina Faso, uh, the keynote speaker, Prof. Monica, thank you very much. Uh, our panelists, some of, uh, most of them have left, the ones who are here in the morning, and the rest of you, thank you very, very much. Uh, our postgraduate and undergraduate students, thank you for staying. We hope that you've now picked interest in these issues and that you'll use all the skills we've given you to cover migration and, and refugees uh, better. Uh, thank you to all our online um, attendees, Anna and um, Mathieu. Thank you very, very much. We appreciate the fact that you had to connect with us remotely. We don't take that for granted. Uh, Ultimate Multimedia, thank you for um, running this remotely and online. Um, and everybody else, our moderators, members of staff who have been with us, thank you. I can't say thank you enough, but thank you. So uh, this event ends here, but for the rest of us, we continue tomorrow and Friday. So we'll be in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences Smart Room. We'll lead you there tomorrow, starting at nine. And still we'll have um, an online uh, presence, so Anna will be able to join us there as well. So thank you everybody, safe journey, and may God bless you all. Comment s'appelle Sarah. Sa Sarah. Sarah, vous avez très bien parlé français, on a très bien compris, c'était parfait. Effectivement, c'est un très beau pays, l'Ouganda. Bravo à, à vous. Merci beaucoup. Ok, so uh, we have a cup of tea that um, you're most welcome to before you leave.